Hello everyone and welcome to NPARC's Spotlight. My name is Leslie and I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. Thank you for joining us today and for those that have attended our previous sessions, welcome back. This series aims to introduce and promote appreciation for our local biodiversity. We are online every Saturday morning from 10.30 to 11.30 and you can join us on Zoom or watch the sessions live on YouTube. Today's is the sixth in our series. The past couple of weeks, we've looked at different types of habitats, from rainforests to our coastlines and into the sea. Now, we'll be focusing on our feathered friends. Our speaker will be sharing about some of the over 400 native and migratory bird species that can be found in Singapore. As usual, here is our program. I'm nearly done with the introduction, and then we'll soon hand the time to our speaker, Lo Pingwen, who is a senior manager at the National Biodiversity Center. If at any time a question strikes you, do send it to me, Leslie, as a private message using the Zoom chat. We'll try to address a few during the Q&A later before we wrap up. And now, let's hear about our fascinating bird life. From Lo Pingwen, Senior Manager of the Terrestrial Branch at the National Biodiversity Centre. Over to you, Pingwen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pingwen, and this morning, I hope that through this short talk, you will be able to catch a glimpse into the lives of Singapore's fascinating birds. Before we start, I thought it would be good to get some idea of how much you guys in the audience know about our local birds and what you think of them. As such, it would be great if you could go to this Menti link and, and use the code on the screen there to answer a few simple questions. So the first one is pretty straightforward and is meant to, to find out what birds come to your mind if someone asks you the question, what birds do we have here in Singapore? So I'll just give you some time to enter the code and join the session and we will see what answers we get. Okay, there seems to be a lot of pigeons. There's some more interesting answers like red crown barbets in there, but still many miners, many pigeons, a few sunbirds, some hornbills. Ooh, there's some rarities in there now. You have greater spotted eagles. Okay. Okay, so the most popular entries are pretty unsurprising. They are mostly our common garden birds. It seems that miners, pigeons, crows, and hornbills seem to dominate proceedings. Uh, we will now move on to the next question, which is more a word association. So all of you guys have used, have mentioned these cool birds there. And the next thing I would like to find out is what words or short phrases come to your mind when you think about these birds. It can be a simple one word um, emotion, or it could be a short phrase. So let's see what words you guys come up with. Okay, some pretty positive words there. Lots of colorful, beautiful, amazing. Okay, there are some more pragmatic answers in there like annoying at times.
Okay, so surprisingly, it still seems that the color still strikes everyone, even though our most abundant urban birds are not necessarily the most colorful. All right, so I think we'll stop it there. Thanks for all your responses. So the idea of this talk today is to give you a greater appreciation and insight into some of these birds, some of which may be colorful and others occur in our landscape, but are generally not well noticed by people. So our little primer has shown that all of you more or less are familiar with these three birds on the screen. You have your Javan minor, your Eurasian tree sparrow, and the rock dove. And you probably see all of this on a daily basis since these are the words most people came up with, or species rather, when asked about what birds we have in Singapore. Now, the purpose of the talk today is meant to provide you with greater insight and appreciation into the many other birds that inhabit Singapore, but are large, go largely unnoticed by many people. So some of these, as you guys mentioned, can be really colorful, and they can include birds like the Van Hesselt sunbird, the blue crown hang parrot, and the blue winged pita. All of these birds can actually be seen even in our heartlands and some of our urban parks. And there are but three of the over 410 species of birds recorded in Singapore to date. So these, all these birds can be classified into three main categories. We have our resident birds, we have our migrant birds, and last but not least, our accidentals. So resident birds, as their name implies, are your Singaporeans. They occur all year round and they breed here. And the breeding season generally lasts between the months of December to July. And this is meant to coincide with the end of the, our annual Northeast monsoon, when food resources like insects are more plentiful and making, making it easier for many of these birds to raise their chicks. Now, many Singaporeans love our accolades and our rankings. So here are three record holders among our resident birds. We shall start with the smallest bird coming in at nine centimeters, which is the scarlet back flowerpecker. So flowerpeckers in general are really small. And I remember from reading early bird books of ornithologists exploring our region, where they would remark that these flowerpeckers were so small that you could actually fit multiple individuals into a teacup. And that's literally how small they are. And not surprisingly, even though the flowerpecker is very common in our urban landscape, it goes unnoticed by many people because it lives in the canopy and you often see it little more than as a dot. However, it still plays an important role in pollinating and dispersing the seeds of our native trees and shrubs. At the other end of the spectrum, you have Singapore's tallest bird, which at around 1.15 meters is the great built heron. And I always remember this bird because of an analogy that a local birder once told me when I was a young, young birder. So it, it might sound a bit lame, but he mentioned that the great built heron was so tall that if it were to take public transport in Singapore, it would actually be one of the few birds that actually needed to pay a fare because it would exceed the 0 0.9 meter height limit that is used to allow children to travel for free. That's how tall this bird actually is. And as you can tell from the picture, sometimes being tall does have its advantages. So the great built heron lives along our coastline. And what it uses this height for is that it allows it to wade in much deeper water than what other water birds do. So you have your shorebirds on the mudflats. Sometimes the egrets will be on the edge between the waves and the beach, but your great built heron will always be wading in the water and that would give him unrestricted access to the big juicy morsels of seafood like this sea bass that you see in the picture here. Now, a spin-off from this is that people would then ask, okay, so by height, you have your great built heron. What then is the bird with the longest wingspan in Singapore? And not surprisingly, that title belongs to an eagle and specifically the white-bellied sea eagle which many of you would probably have seen soaring over our water bodies. So like many eagles, 
the females are usually bigger than the males. And some of the largest females that we have have wingspans of well over two meters. And despite its large size and intimidating stature, the sea eagle actually has a very specialized diet. So it feeds primarily on fish and sea snakes. And many people tend to be surprised by how a bird like this is able to catch sea snakes. And what they do is that they have adapted to taking advantage of the short window that sea snakes, where sea snakes come to the water surface to breathe because they're still air breeders and they use this time to look out for them and catch them as prey. Next, we will move on to my favorite class of birds, the migratory birds or migrants for short. So these are birds that migrate to avoid the northern winter. And what this means is that you have a wide variety of birds that breed in temperate countries. And when autumn sets in, the days become shorter and food becomes harder to find. These birds start making an epic journey south to spend the warmer, to spend the winter in the tropical climates of our region before heading back to their breeding grounds to breed. And it never ceases to amaze me that these birds come in all shapes and sizes, and that even some of the birds that make these epic journeys are no larger than the palm of your hand, and yet they still see more of the world on a yearly basis than most people ever do in their lifetime. So one common misconception that we have with migratory birds is that people always tell me, oh, if you want to see migratory birds, you have to go to Sunai Budo Wetland Reserve. That is partially true, but the fact is that in all our parks and nature reserves, you actually get migratory birds of all kinds. And these can be split into water birds, land birds, and birds of prey. So flocks of shorebirds are all, and egrets can be classified as water birds. And these are probably the most conspicuous to the average park visitor because they tend to occur in flocks. And if not, they're quite big. So in Singapore, we mainly have shorebirds and egrets, but for those of you who are more familiar with the water birds from more temperate countries, birds like swans, geese, ducks, and even cranes also migrate, but very few of them travel as far south as Southeast Asia. Next, we move on to the land birds, and these are probably my favorite types of migratory birds. So many of them live in the forest, and they tend to go unnoticed unless you go looking for them because firstly, they can be very small like this Arctic warbler, which is only slightly larger than the scarlet black flower pecker we mentioned earlier. And their habits are also quite different. So many of them migrate individually and they do it at night. And the reason for this is that it helps them avoid predators that would hunt for them using their eyesight in the daytime. And it also prevents them from overheating. Because as you can imagine, when you're migrating thousands of kilometers in the tropical heat, you can lose water very quickly. Last but not least, it might surprise some people, but even your kings of the sky are not spared from these epic journeys. So your eagles, your falcons, and your buzzards, when winter comes, they too have to make the journey south because it becomes harder to find food. And in some cases, their food has actually already gone south for the winter. So the birds have to follow them along the way. So once again, the raptors have a very different migratory behavior from the other two birds in that they migrate during the heat of the day when many people are either having lunch or sitting comfortably in their aircon room. So for those of us who brave the blazing sun to watch them, what these raptors do is that they migrate really high in the sky because they take advantage of the hot air rising from the Earth's surface, known as thermals, to allow them to cover vast distances very quickly. Unfortunately, what this means for human observers is that you see them as little more than specks in the sky, like what this picture shows. And unless you have a telescope or a long telephoto lens, it can be very difficult to identify these birds. Now, all of these birds, big and small, migrate along what is known as a flyway. There are nine major flyways in the world, and the one that Singapore is situated on is known as the East Asia Australasian Flyway, or if you pre prefer your acronyms, it's just EAAF. 
So this flyway encompasses over 20 countries and actually stretches from Alaska, which is beyond the map here, through to Eastern Russia and East Asia and Southeast Asia down through Australia and, Singapore, and New Zealand, sorry. So the birds move along a southward migration. And as you can see, for, for many birds, Singapore, which is denoted by the purple star at the tip of the Thai Malay Peninsula, actually represents the, either the end point or the last stopover point before they end up in Sumatra and Java, where they spend the winter months. And before we go, a parting note that you can see that the scale is actually measured in thousands of kilometers. So you can imagine that for a small bird to migrate from Siberia to Singapore, that's a one-way trip of over 10,000 kilometers potentially. And although migration can be awe-inspiring to us as observers, uh, it's often known among ornithologists as the great equalizer, where it's the ultimate test of endurance for any bird. And because of the journey is long, many things can go wrong along the way. You can bump into bad weather and be blown off course, or you can have your internal GPS systems, if you will, fail for one reason or other. And that creates the third category of birds, which we call accidentals. So accidentals are birds that occur in areas that they are not supposed to, because what happens is that they, during migration, something not so good happens to them. They might be blown off course, or they might lose their way, or, or there are some reasons that even scientists don't really fully understand. So for a bird watcher, finding an accidental in your backyard is often the most thrilling aspect of bird watching during the migratory season. And that can be said of the bird watchers who found this very colorful forest bird, the fairy pitta, in our central nature reserve last year, which was also the first record for, for Singapore and I think made headlines in our mainstream media. However, sometimes you don't even need to go looking for the accidentals, they come to you. And immediately after the fairy pitta sighting, we had this early this year, where office workers were just going about their normal work day when they saw a flock of massive birds soaring around the office towers in the CBD. And these belong to the Himalayan vulture. So the vultures to me epitomize what is so mysterious about our flyways in that as their name suggests, they actually breed on the roof of the world in the Himalayas and they are not known to migrate. But scientists cannot figure out why. In most years, you get small numbers of these vultures, almost all of which are young birds appearing in Southeast Asian countries. And this year, Singapore was graced by the presence of 12 of these birds. And as you can see, the various media outlets all had their own interpretations of it with some interesting headlines. And on that note, for those of you who are looking to a career into studying birds and bird migration, I can tell you that the mysteries of our flyway, like these vultures, uh, will take several lifetimes to unravel. So if you would like to take on that challenge, you're more than welcome to join the very few researchers who are working on the bird migrations in this flyway. Now, all these birds, whether resident or migratory, they inhabit specific habitat types. So again, you, for easy reference, you can classify these into wetlands, forests, and grasslands. So your wetlands can include freshwater wetlands like ponds, marshes, and rivers, while coastal wetlands can be things like mudflats, um, beaches, and mangroves. For forests, it's a bit more straightforward. It's either primary forest, meaning that forest which has never been disturbed by people before, and secondary forest, which refers to any other type of disturbed forest and is also the dominant habitat type in Singapore today. Last but not least, we have our grasslands, which are characterized by a variety of long grasses, shrubs, and scattered trees. So in each of these habitat types, you have birds that have uniquely adapted to thrive in them. So many forest birds, like the blue-winged leaf bird, has shades of green in their plumage because it provides excellent camouflage when they move through the trees. For water birds, like the lesser whistling duck, they have webbed feet, which makes them very good swimmers and allows them to traverse the wetlands easily. In the grasslands, grass seeds are a plentiful supply of food, 
if you know how to open them. So seed-eating birds like the Baya weaver have strong conical shaped bills, which they use to crack the tough outer casing to get to the seeds within. Now, one of the most fascinating aspects of bird behavior is the nest which they build to raise their chicks in. And as you would expect, the variety of these nests are as varied as the builders themselves. So most of you would be familiar with the most common depiction of the cup-shaped nest in popular culture and media. And it is true that this type of nest, like the one built by the, this black-headed booboo here, is the most commonly built nest and is used by many smaller birds to provide an unobtrusive home to raise their chicks. For the larger birds like the changeable hawk eagle and water birds like our grey heron, they build these messy platform nests at the tops of tall trees, which gives them a panoramic view of the surroundings. And then, of course, there are birds that don't build any nests at all. The nocturnal large-tailed nightjar simply lays her eggs in the leaf litter and relies entirely on the excellent camouflage of her and her youngsters to keep them safe from predators. Now, like many things in nature, you have unusual exceptions. And here are three of the, of the more unusual nesters you can find out of Singapore's birds. So the first one we will look at is the Baya weaver. And their breeding journey can sometimes be likened to that of a first-time property buyer looking to buy his HDB flat. Now, why, why would I say that? Because the process starts with the male Baya weaver. So male bio weavers build their nests in colonies. And what they do is that at the start of the breeding season, every male will meticulously collect thousands of grass blades to sow these intricate nests in order to attract a female. Now, mind you, the nest that you see in the picture is not actually complete. It's only about 60 to 70% done. And you can imagine that in a colony, there will be multiple males all standing in front of their own creation hoping to attract a female. And what the female does is like a shrewd home buyer. She visits all of these show flats individually. And if she likes what she sees, she allows the male to mate with her. Then what happens is that the male will then complete the remaining 30% of the nest and then hand over the keys as it were to the female. So she has to lay the eggs and raise the young entirely on her own. And what does the male do? His role is to then go to another part of the colony and build another new nest out of thousands of blades of grass and hope to attract another female to allow him to mate with her. So in contrast to this very strict roles for each gender in the bio weaver's breeding behavior, you have our charismatic oriental pied hornbills. And now if there was an award for the best husband out of all of Singapore's birds, the male oriental pride hornbill would probably win that by a country mile. And why is that? That's because hornbill chicks take many months to fledge. And so what happens is for increased protection, what the female hornbill does is that from the time she lays her eggs to the time that the eggs, that the chicks hatch and then fledge, she actually seals herself in the nesting cavity with a layer of mud and only leaves a tiny opening just enough for the male to pass her and her offspring food. As such, you can imagine that the male is literally the guy who's bringing home the bacon for both of these families. And how does the male do that? He actually does just, just that, in that he actually changes his diet during the breeding season from a fruit-based one to a more animal-based product. So, so many of you would, the first thing you would tell me is, oh, I always associate hornbills with eating fruit. How come this hornbill is suddenly eating a bat or a young bird from another nest? That's because the, the hornbill switches its diet so that it can provide more, more protein, I suppose, for the chicks to develop more quickly. And I like to think that by giving the female choice treats, it actually, it actually helps gain him brownie points since this female is on voluntary stay home notice for months on end with a growing child. So at the other end of the spectrum, what we have are parents that don't do anything at all. 
So the Slacker's Parent Award would probably go to the cuckoos that can be found in Singapore. And the most famous of which is probably the Asian Coel, but we have many other smaller ones like the Banded Bay Cuckoo that are much more difficult to observe, but perform the same antiques. So to many of you, you would know cuckoos for their unique breeding behavior, where what the parents do is that they lay their eggs in the nest of foster birds, usually birds smaller than themselves, and they leave the foster birds to raise the cuckoo chick entirely on their own. And this is still the case in Singapore. And what happens is you get scenarios like this, where after weeks of tender loving care, you have a voracious eating machine that is the cuckoo chick that dwarfs the, the size of its smaller parent. And I can say from personal experience that the sight of a small foster parent, like this female common Iora having to stick her entire head into the cuckoo's mouth just to make sure that he gets his food, is probably one of the weirder sights you can see while bird watching in Singapore. So you have heard quite a fair bit about the cool birds that call Singapore home or use it as a second home during the winter months. And one of the questions that might come up in your mind is, what is being done to ensure that all of these birds will have a place to live and breed in Singapore? So the next section of the presentation will go into the conservation initiatives that NPARCS has initiated to ensure the survival of all of these birds and how everyone not just us as NPARC staff and researchers can play an integral role in ensuring that these birds will remain a part of our city in nature. So we'll start with a simple overview of the local bird conservation scene. And as many of you would know, Singapore is a small, highly urbanized country, and many of our birds are restricted to the remaining habitats that you can find all over the island. However, despite our small size, there is also this interesting phenomenon where some species are actually more common here than elsewhere in the world. And the most famous of that that we have is this beautiful straw-headed booboo that you see in front of you. So this is the largest booboo in Southeast Asia and it also, in my view, has the most amazing song. However, this amazing song is also its downfall because in other parts of its home range, it has been trapped out largely for the cage bird trade and as such, it's actually classified as globally critically endangered. However, this species remains pleasingly common in Singapore, and many people can actually see them in, the, in a wide variety of parks all across the island. And in fact, some of you may even have had the fortune of having this bird breed in your balcony or in your garden if you live close to some of these parks. So for those of you tuning in on Zoom, there's, you can probably see a link in your chat now that discusses more about the plight of this straw-headed booboo and how Singapore is now regarded as a global stronghold for this threatened species. So what is NPARCS doing to ensure that birds like the straw-headed booboo will continue to thrive in Singapore? So as part of our vision to become a city in nature, we have devised four key strategies that will help benefit our local bird life. The first is to extend our nature park network, which in turn implies the conservation of key bird habitats across the island. Next, we hope to improve habitat quality, not just in our gardens and parks, but also in the urban landscape as a whole, because this would encourage a wider variety of birds to not just use our urban landscapes, but to move between the green spaces. And that's where the last strategy comes in, which is to improve connectivity between these places so that birds can colonize new areas and find additional habitats to play. And once again, the important takeaway here is that everyone has a role to play in, in these strategies and you can find out more as we go through each of them in turn. So the first involves conserving key habitats and to some of you in the audience, this picture might be familiar to you. It is one of our more recently announced nature parks, the Mandai mangroves and mudflats. It, it is also the most important foraging area for migratory shorebirds and waterbirds in Singapore. So more, more recently, you probably have heard of another important habitat for waterbirds that will become a nature park, which is Katip Bongsu, located in the northeastern coast of Singapore. So these areas 
will now be conserved for water birds, thereby ensuring that the most important foraging areas for them in Singapore have a more secure future. On land, we already have a network of nature parks around our nature reserve that is being expanded regularly. Last year, the eastern end, the, the newest nature park we had was Thompson Nature Park, which was opened at the eastern end of our nature reserve. And the next one would be Rifle Range Nature Park, which is in the southern end of the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. Now taken together, all of these nature parks will provide additional breeding and foraging areas for our forest birds. At the same time, they also function as a buffer to the nature reserves themselves, thereby making the future of all the forest birds that live in this area more secure. Now, the most obvious way to see the effects of this strategy is by looking at Singapore from space at night, as you can see from this picture here. The first thing that might surprise you is that there's still a fair portion of this country with natural greenery, which is denoted by the dark, undeveloped patches. And many of these circles show the largest tracts of these, of these remaining greenery, which also coincide with the key habitats we mentioned previously. You have your west leftmost circle, which comprises the western area, including the western catchment, Kranji marshes, Sunai Bulo, and Mandai mudflats. You have the central circle, which focuses on our nature reserves and adjacent nature parks. And you have the eastern circle, which comprises our forested islands of Pulau Ubin and Pulau Tekong. Now, the, the sharper ones in the audience would then highlight, but the area between all of these circles is so developed, so bright. So what is being done to connect all of these three spaces together? So for that, we have our various initiatives to improve ecological connectivity between these areas. The most conspicuous of this is probably the Ecolink at BKE, which many of you would be familiar with. It was first opened in 2013. And as you can see from this picture, the forest there has regenerated nicely. And now is being used by a variety of forest birds to move between the two nature reserves. This principle of forest regeneration is also being applied to our urban landscapes in the form of nature ways that you see on your left and more naturalistic rooftop gardens that you see below. So nature ways are essentially vegetated sidewalks where the planting structure has been, has been so-called curated to mimic the natural structure of a rainforest. So you have your canopy, your understory, and your ground layers. So this is meant to encourage a greater variety of birds to move through our urban landscape between the green spaces. This same principle also applies to many of our naturalistic roof gardens in various housing areas. So this picture is actually of a very small rooftop garden in Pongo which has a surprising number of birds, given that it's only less than half a hectare in size. So surveys here have recorded over 30 species of birds, including resident birds, as well as migratory birds that use this area as a refueling stop on their journeys. And this is meant to indicate that even small patches of greenery can have very profound impacts on local bird life in the area. So this is NPARCS's vision that by 2030, we will have a comprehensive network of parks, park connectors and nature ways that not only can be used by people for recreation, but it will allow birds to travel not just between the core habitats, but to also reach any other smaller patches of greenery along the way, thereby increasing their survival prospects. Now, all of these initiatives, like where do I conserve, what's the best area to connect were not randomly decided on the fly. They were done with the backup of robust scientific research and NPARCS does extensive research into both our resident and migratory birds. In particular, the advent of technology like miniature satellite trackers means that we can now gain insight into bird behavior that was previously impossible. So one such example of this is the satellite tracking of migratory shorebirds like this Wimbro that you see here. And the results can be used both not just at a local level,
but at an international one as well. So at a local level, what satellite tracking of our migratory shorebird showed is that Sunai Bulo and Mandai mudflats are strongly interdependent on each other because what the birds do is that at low tide, they would fly from Sunai Bulo to feed on the mudflats and then at high tide, they would return to Sunai Bulo to roost. Therefore, if you wanted to ensure the survival of these migratory birds at one of their important wintering grounds in Singapore, we would then have needed to conserve both Sunai Bulo Wetland Reserve and Mandai Mud Flats, which is what we have now done and will hopefully give them a more secure future when they winter in Singapore. These results can also be shown at an international level and allow Singapore to contribute to research along the entire flyway. So this shows the return journey of one of the Wimbros tagged in Singapore and how it traveled back to its breeding ground in Russia and then back again to Singapore, all in a, in a relatively short time frame of less than six months. So the first thing you'll probably notice is that many migratory shorebirds live life in the fast lane. Apart from the two months or so that they spend raising chicks in Russia, they are either traveling big distances in a single day, or they are stopping at important stopover sites along the way to refuel and regain energy levels. And it is these stopover sites that are arguably the most important to ensuring a secure future for these birds. So you can imagine that if there were no mud flats left in Eastern China or around Korea, then the birds would not have the required energy to migrate from their breeding grounds in Russia all the way down to their wintering grounds in Singapore. And on that note, one of the greatest conservation success stories in my view of 2019 was actually the inscription of the incredibly rich mudflats along China's eastern coastline as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this was particularly amazing because nobody expected that these areas would ever be given formal protection because as many of you probably know, the eastern coast of China is one of the most heavily developed coastlines in the world. But thanks to studies like this, that where we are able to show, where researchers rather from all along the flyway are able to show policymakers that look, there are millions of these shorebirds moving to and from, and they are stopping at just a few areas along the coastline. So it is therefore it, and very important to protect these if we want to secure a future for these birds. So data like this can be used to conserve birds, not just in Singapore, but along the, the entirety of the inter international flyway as well. Now, another trend that has been growing in modern times is that a lot of this data is not just collected by researchers or NPARCS officers. There is a growing recognition of the importance of citizen scientists like many of you in the audience and the important role that you guys play in helping us to document the bird communities in our parks and urban areas and how our efforts at intensifying greenery is helping them along. So in N parks, we already have teams of enthusiastic volunteers who not only go to our parks and green spaces to document the bird communities there, but they also share their passion for bird life by leading guided walks and for the general public, allowing them to better appreciate the birds that live in Singapore. And if this sounds like something for you, the good news is that there are many avenues that you can engage in if you want to take this up. The first of which is the CIN Biodiversity Watches, which refers to the community in nature for, for short. And what these watches do is that we send trained scientists citizen scientists or volunteers out to our parks and nature reserves to document the wildlife, various wildlife groups found there. And for birds, the two main ones that we have are the heron watch, which focuses on this family of iconic water birds known as herons and egrets. And we have the garden bird watch, which is more general and focuses on all the birds resident or migratory that you can find in our parks and nature parks. So these surveys are conducted twice yearly during the breeding season and migratory season so that we get a more holistic view of how the bird communities in these areas change between these two periods. So the poster on the left 
it shows the results collected by our citizen scientists from the recently concluded Heron Watches that was organized earlier this year, while the document on the right shows how we tweaked this year's Garden Bird Watch to allow our volunteers to stay safe at home while still contributing valuable data on our urban bird communities. And as a side note, for those of you who are wondering, if you spend some time staring out your window, you'll be surprised that you can actually see a wide variety of birds more than just your miners or your rock pigeons or doves. And in the Zoom chat, once again, there's probably a link that, can, that showcases some of the cool birds that people have observed through their windows from the comfort of their own home. For those of you who prefer a more hands-on approach, you can participate in a variety of habitat enhancement initiatives in our parks. And these can include anything from reforesting our nature parks to replanting our mangroves, or even removing invasive plant species that are affecting the growth of our forest plants. All of this is meant to improve the habitat quality within our parks and nature reserves to allow a greater number of birds to breed and forage in them. So if you have heard enough about all of these birds and would like to go out into the field and find some of them for yourself, the good news is that unlike when I first started bird watching, there are now many resources for the amateur bird watcher to really get into the hobby. So if you are the old fashioned type that prefers the satisfaction of flipping a physical book and looking at colorful pictures of our birds, you can purchase portable guides like the Naturalist Guide to the Birds of Singapore, which has pictures and descriptions of many of Singapore's bird life. If you are the more tech savvy sort who would prefer to have everything in the palm of your hand without the weight of a book, you can download various apps like the SG Bio Atlas or the Field Guide to the Birds of Singapore, which contains similar things, just probably at a lower resolution, but you don't have to carry a book with you on your bird watching trips anymore. So this is all I have for this morning, but before I pass the time back to Leslie, uh, I've shared quite a few interesting tidbits this morning. And what I would like to do is to find out which one of them has left the most lasting impression on you. So again, if you could go to menti.com and use this code, I would like to find out out of everything that you heard this morning, what is the most interesting thing which you learned about Singapore's birds today? I will give you guys some time to join in and we'll have a look at the answers that we get. Okay, so far, I like what I'm seeing. There's a lot of, of interest in migratory birds about things like travel distance, where they're coming from. Straw-headed booboos are nice. You have more birds again that go to Siberia and back again. Okay, there are many people who are very interested in bird migration more than anything else. Okay, there's a lucky person in the audience who actually saw the fairy pita last year and was part of and was part of this overnight sensation. Hey, there's also some talk on nesting behavior. Okay, so overall, I think I'm pretty happy to know that all of you, a lot of you guys took away different points from the talk. Um, for those of you who want to study migratory birds, then Yes, I would strongly encourage you to do that because I'm biased like that, but straw-headed boo-boos are great too, and things about accidental species and unusual nesters are all great. So hopefully you guys had an enriching talk session this morning and learned a couple of things, which seems like you guys learned quite a fair bit. And I will now pass the time back to Leslie, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Penguin. You've shown us a whole variety of species. Some of them are very eye-catching. Some of them have interesting behavior and ecology. 
And that's probably why we got a lot of questions too. So thank you to all those who submitted their questions. Okay, so we'll now proceed with our Q&A. So the first question for you, Ping Wen, is what is your favorite bird? And maybe you could share why as well. Okay, so uh, that's pretty easy. Uh, for me, the, my, my favorite bird was uh, is the greater racket tail drongo because that's actually what got me started on this crazy journey that has now taken me through most of my lifetime. So how this started was when I was just a kid, I still remember I was about nine years old, uh, I went to our nature reserves and one of the first birds that I saw was this, was this great bird that had very strange tail, a very strange tail fly in front of me. And at that time, I didn't own any bird book and I couldn't figure out what this bird was. So I started rummaging around in my collection and thankfully, we had this small pocket guide to Singapore's birds published by the Science Center back in the day. And it just so happened to have a picture of this bird that we call the greater racket tail drongo. And if you go look that up, you can see that what it has is that its tail is actually modified into these rackets. And aside from that, I find the drongo cool because it's also a very intelligent bird and is able to mimic a wide variety of not just human other bird sounds in its ecosystem as well. Okay, so to answer the question, it's the greater racket tail drongo. And for those who want to look out for it, maybe the next time you visit Botanic Gardens or Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, look out for a black bird with a long tail with rackets at the end. All right, next is, what is the rarest accidental that has been recorded in Singapore? Ooh, this is a very subjective question because I would say that um, most of the, ac what accidentals mean is that you probably see them once every decade or maybe even in the case of some birds, you get them, there's only like one record throughout bird watching in Singapore's recorded history. So in terms of the rarest accidental, I don't think there is a, is a single one. Maybe if you are referring to quite possibly the most threatened one, I would say even the fairy pita might qualify because it's actually globally vulnerable. It, it's a bird that breeds in, in East China and Taiwan and comes down. But yeah, I really don't, honestly don't really know the answer to that question because it really depends on, on whether you're talking about rarest in the sense that it's a threatened bird or whether that, you know, it just doesn't normally come to Singapore. And we have actually have many birds that do that because Singapore is such a small country and is so well watched. There are actually many birds in that 20% of accidentals that only have one Singapore record. Okay, I hope that answers the question. So we'll move on to the next one, which is if tropical areas like Singapore provide an abundance of food year round, then why don't the migratory species stay here to breed? So that is an, an excellent question, I think. And one of the reasons for that could just be the carrying capacity of the habit, of the habit, various habitats. So a lot of the tropical areas already have existing tropical birds that live and breed there. And although we see small numbers each time, you know, of migratory birds that we go into the forest, actually the number of birds that sort of migrate to these areas can be a lot. So if I were to use the example of the Arctic warbler, I would say that the entire world population of Arctic warblers actually migrates from Siberia and spends the winter months in parts of Southeast Asia, like Singapore and Sumatra, things like that. And even in Singapore, some of the conservative estimates are that there could be as many as tens of thousands of Arctic warblers that live among us during the winter months. And I'm sure actually that even if some of you guys haven't actually seen the bird, you would have heard it. And therein lies the answer to this question, which is that you already have your own resident birds that inhabit various parts of your ecosystem. The local ecosystem here probably cannot support this many so-called additional breeding birds that come in if they were to stay all year round. So hopefully that answers your question. But again, like I said, the bird migration has many mysteries and it could well, this could well be one of the questions that you use to start a master's thesis or even a PhD project. 
Okay, so this has to do with the carrying capacity of the habit. Uh, we are very fortunate to see a variety of migratory birds in Singapore, but we also have uh, a lot of local species as well. But then again, maybe there are more answers to be found for this question. Next, what are we doing to increase the number of native species? So I think broadly speaking, uh, as Leslie mentioned for the previous question, the biggest question you want to address with regard to increasing the number of birds in general is to increase the carrying capacity of the habitats. So as you guys know, there's, there's trade-offs in Singapore between green spaces and development. So one of the things that we want to do to increase the numbers of native birds broadly is to increase the quality of the existing habitats that are already in our parks and nature parks and reserves so that more birds can utilize a similarly sized area because for, for instance, if you inc improve the complexity of your forest, there can be more insects there and more places for birds to breed. So hopefully through habitat enhancement initiatives like planting more trees, removing invasive species, you can have more an increased number of birds inhabiting the existing green areas in Singapore while we continue to work towards conserving other key habitats for birds in Singapore. Okay, so we need to, it, it's important to find a balance, but through certain strategies like habitat enhancement, we can try to make the environment conducive for more of these native species. Next, do you have any tips for beginner bird watchers? And what, what's a good place to bird to watch birds in Singapore. Okay, my first and most important tip for beginner bird watchers is also the one that tends to put most people off from bird watching is that you have to be incredibly disciplined to wake up early because you're not going to be a good bird watcher if you wake up at 9 a.m. every day, go to the park and expect to see a lot of birds. So many people think that bird watchers are crazy because we sometimes wake up at 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning just to reach the forest at 7, but that is to be expected. And if you actually want to have the best experience, you would have to start disciplining yourself to wake up early. So beyond that, the next tip I would give you is to buy a pair of binoculars. You don't have to use a very expensive one, just a cheap one will do because any binoculars is better than using the human eye because as you would imagine, when you see birds around you, they usually appear as just black and brown blobs and having a binoculars would allow you to see these birds up close and appreciate their various features. The last tip I would probably give is to understand that bird, bird watching is not the same as hiking through the forest. You actually want to take your time, um, learn the bird calls. And the best way to learn the bird calls is to actually try to find, in the when you are first starting out, is to try to find all the birds that are making these sounds so that you can associate these sounds with these birds in the future. And to do that, you actually have to take it slow, look out for movement and the sounds, and try to see what birds are making these calls. Uh, in terms of what is a good place to watch birds in Singapore, I personally would recommend that you don't immediately go straight to the nature reserves or the nature parks. And the reason for that is because like how you learn to ride a bicycle, you start with your training wheels. You don't go straight to the deep end. And one of the things I realized is that if you bring somebody to a place like Crunchy Marshes, if there isn't an experienced bird watcher to tell you what all of these birds and that are making the sounds are, it can be very overwhelming for the novice. So you can choose to start out in your local park, maybe get familiar with things like the Orioles and Sunbirds, and then you can graduate to some of the more accessible regional gardens. So places like Jurong Lake Gardens, uh, Singapore Botanic Gardens, even Gardens by the Bay actually has a bird list like that is well over 150 species combined among all of these three areas. And you can easily come to grips with many of the birds that can be found in Singapore there. All right, so if I were to summarize a few of the tips that you highlighted. First, you know, you have to be an early bird yourself to, to bird watch, you know, go, go early in the morning. And second is to have the right tools with you. So binoculars are very handy. And third, to keep your eyes and ears open. 
And when it comes to looking for a place to go bird watching, you don't really have to go far from home. You can start with your neighborhood park before moving into the nature reserves. So our final question for you is, what is one surprising thing about birds that you have found during your work with NBC? Okay, so, so I'll start off with a bit of context. So when I was young, I was probably like the only uh, bird watcher among my cohort in school. And I remember they, they used to use this uh, term that you can find in the English dictionary known as bird brain. And in that sense, I hope that they used it positively on me because I know that it actually refers to a silly person. And through my work at NBC, what I've come to realize is that birds in general tend to be a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. So for some of you guys, you know, you might be aware that, oh, actually owls and parrots are very intelligent, but a lot of the other birds are pretty dumb. And having look, studied these birds for most of my life, I can tell you that the intelligence actually spreads, is actually crosses all the families, not just a few. So if I were to give you some examples, you can relate to things like, like olive back sunbirds that might nest in your balcony, and they might even use material from your undergarments or laundry to line their nests. You have striated herons in our waterways and ponds that pick up the bread you, you guys throw and in turn use it as bait to catch fish. All of this, they wouldn't have learned naturally. They must have learned it somehow by observing other birds, maybe their parents do it before them and then learned how to do it as such. So the next time you look at the miners and, and sparrows around you, don't think they are very stupid because I can assure you that many of these birds are much more intelligent than you think they are. Okay, so nature has the capacity to surprise us in many ways and we are fortunate that a variety of birds can thrive here in Singapore. So I'd just like to highlight that Ping Wen has shared various strategies to conserve birds and these all come under the Nature Conservation Master Plan, a multifaceted approach to conserving our biodiversity and transforming Singapore into a city in nature. For more information, do check out our first NPARC Spotlight Talk on YouTube. There's a segment in which our group director, Lim Yang Jim, outlines this plan. You can also check out the links being shared in the chat. All of our previous talks can also be viewed on YouTube, We've covered a variety of topics, nocturnal mammals, sea turtles, intertidal creatures, and terrestrial and marine habitats. And next Saturday, you can also stream our talk about spiders live on YouTube. Titled Not Just Web Builders, you can learn about a whole range of hunting strategies that spiders use aside from building webs. So do join us on next Saturday at the same time, 10.30 to 11.30. I'm also very excited to share that we've got more talks coming up in August. You can learn about creatures in our streams, our seas, and some interesting bees. So um, details on how you can sign up will be out soon on our social media channels. And with that, I'd like to thank Bing Wen and our audiences in both Zoom and YouTube for being with us today. I hope you've enjoyed the session. And if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. So please scan the QR code on my screen. To find out more about upcoming talks, visit our website or connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, Twitter, and YouTube. And the links for all these are being shared in the chat. So thank you all for attending today's session. Have a great weekend. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>